Good day, Real Vision subscribers. This is Tony Greer of TG Macro. I'm here with our friend Doomberg of the Doomberg team. Doom, how you doing today? Tony, doing great. Uh, always great to be back with you here on, on Real Vision and looking forward to another fantastic discussion. Yeah, let's go right into, I think we have to start um, over at the European energy crisis, which has been one of the topics of our talks. Okay, I'm going to read you a headline from the journal this morning. The Russian gas cuts, Russian gas cuts threaten the world's largest chemicals hub. All of a sudden, we've got BASF in Germany potentially shutting down one of the largest chemical plants in the country. And that just brings me right back, Doom. Literally, I think I pulled the quote from Starvation Diet in my head right away, where you say, to keep the chemistry lesson as simple as possible, you need natural gas to produce ammonia and energy from fossil fuels to mine for phosphate. You need ammonia and phosphate to make fertilizer you need fertilizer to grow food at scale, and you need food to keep the peace. It sounds, Doom, like we are sort of skating right on the precipice of um, being able to grow the food and keep the peace where we are now. Is that right? Yeah, that's right, Tony. And, and I think it's important to set some context. We wrote that piece back in October of 2021. And um, the facility that, that the Wall Street Journal was reporting on today is um, BSF's largest and it's the largest chemical facility in the world, uh, the Ludwig Hobson site. And it's um, it's really massive and it uses natural gas, um, not just as an input for raw materials, but also for uh, the industrial heat that they need. And if they can't get the natural gas from Russia and that plant shuts down, it, it it's a big deal. And and I should just give a little bit more um, data for, for, the, for the viewers here. Um, the, the chemical industry is vast, it's important. It feeds um, almost, Everything in our daily lives. We put out a thread um, over the weekend, you know, on where stuff comes from on Twitter that kind of went viral. Um, there's there's lots of chemical sites, but there's these really big, massive integrated sites, and um, the BSF site in Germany is the biggest one in the world and the biggest one in Europe. Um, there's BSF also operates a similarly sized site in China. Um, in the Middle East, there's the mega project called Sidera, which is a joint venture between. Saudi Aramco and Dow. That's a very, very large site, um, the largest chemical site ever built in one construction. Um, and then in the US on the Gulf Coast is Freeport, which is again led by Dow, but also is occupied by all manner of chemical companies. And if any one of these four sites were to quote unquote go offline, um, it's difficult to overstate the disruption on supply chains. Uh, and it's not just ammonia, but of course, there's a huge ammonia plant at the BSF site in Europe, which would only exacerbate the fertilizer crisis and the food crisis. But broadly speaking, we've been warning about how natural gas sits at the very front end of our supply chains and how um, cracking of that whip, you know, the, the, the end of that whip is gonna smash on the concrete in our delicate supply chains in a way that is gonna make a lot of noise. And um, the move by Putin to decrease the gas flow into Europe, this is the first domino that we would have expected to fall it's a big one. Hasn't happened yet, um, but just the the prospect of having to shut down that site would be an engineering feat uh, to do so in a way that doesn't cause permanent damage. For example, it, it's a big, complex site. It's one of the economic epicenters of the global economy, and uh, I would not take that headline lightly. And uh, and unfortunately, it's one that we have been warning about and predicting for the better part of a year. Doom, this is where I love leaning on your science background. Let's just say, I mean, what 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 are the products? Like, can you just list some of the products, maybe aside from fertilizer, that would not be available if that plant was shut down just to just to graze over a few things that would be, you know, disrupted? Yeah, sure. I mean, just it's, it's incalculable to be totally transparent. There's thousands of, you know, there's there's products, there's intermediaries, and then there's the products that depend on those, and it all goes downstream. And yeah, no, and. I, no. and but like, for example, polyurethane foam that you sit on in your seats and your car cushions and, you know, um, polyethylene, anything that flows down from the crackers, it's all, it, it's all going to go tight. It's all going to go pear shaped. Right. Um, it would be a big, big deal. And, you know, it's, it'd be one of those things where there'll be all of a sudden you'll find out that an entire industry is single sourced on something and it happens to have a critical intermediary that's produced in, in, in the site in Germany. And, and then you find out that you have to shut down an automotive factory because they don't have some ingredient that goes into an adhesive that all the cars use. Um, the, the, when you're talking about 
as interconnected and as quote unquote efficient as our modern um, just in time supply chains have become, I would propose and not trying to be alarmist, uh, the world would have a very difficult time dealing with the shutdown of one of these four mega sites, uh, any of the four mega sites um, in their entirety. These sites have had accidents, they've had explosions, um, they've been partially shut down. The industry has dealt with such things. To shut down the whole site, again, because all of the heat at the site is, you know, it, it would be affected. Uh, you know, I think they get 60% of their industrial heat um, by burning natural gas. If they lose natural gas to that site, it's a big deal. Um, I'd have to run some numbers in my head, but I, it's just one of those things that is so off the radar that you just don't, it's sort of like a black swan event for supply chains. It, it, it would be a big deal. It would be very lucrative for the companies that are existing, you know, uh, outside of Europe. And so, for example, Sidera is obviously fed by Saudi Arabia's vast energy resources. Um, the Freeport Gulf Coast facility is fed predominantly by natural gas liquids and, and NAFTA, which are in plentiful supply in the U.S., especially now that we've had this LNG um, explosion in Freeport, which is probably something we could talk about. Um, so the, the, those producers would benefit both because they have access to cheap energy and their, their products are priced at global prices. But I mean, you pick a chemical, um, you'd be hard pressed to find uh, a chemical where that site and BSF site in Germany um, doesn't at least supply part of it. And it, with these inelastic products, you know, 10, 20 percent going offline all at once would be a huge deal. It's just hard. It's hard to underestimate, uh, overestimate. It's a big, big deal. Yeah, this is. And, and, and I want to I want to apply this to the markets in a minute. But I do want to touch on that Freeport LNG facility, which went down about a week and a half ago. Doom, is that is that accurate? Give or take, or was it a week ago? And it was a couple of weeks ago, because you remember, it took about a week for them to confess to the market that um, that it was going to be a, a three month issue, not a three week issue, which was the real dagger in the heart of the U.S. natural gas markets. Um, you know, coming off the highs of nine bucks, kissing ten dollars a million BTU, down to um, six dollars. Um, now, you know, we were joking in the TG Slack room this morning, not joking, commenting on uh, in the TG Slack room this morning. Um, that um, any headline that would indicate that Freeport LNG might be coming back online sooner would be incredibly bullish for U.S. natural gas. But what happened basically is, um, you know, this this plant exploded, and that took offline about twenty percent of the U.S. natural gas export capacity. And people were kind of confused at first, like, why is U.S. natural gas? Why are U.S. natural gas prices? dropping on this news. Well, it's because there's no place to put the gas now. That gas was earmarked to Europe. Um, so what you saw after the news happened is, is U.S. natural gas prices cratered and European natural gas prices spiked. Um, and that makes total sense because those, those, that production was earmarked for, for Europe. Now, good news for U.S. consumers, and, and we're both in that camp, um, that gas being stuck here reduces the chance of a gas crisis uh, unfolding in the natural uh, in the North American, you know, markets this winter, which I'm personally grateful for. Um, we were running somewhere between 15 and 20 percent behind historical storage uh, inventories for this time of the year, and that's why you're beginning to see, you know, natural gas prices go up to nine or ten dollars per million BTU. I think um, the longer Freeport LNG is offline, the the more we could use that gas to uh, increase our storage inventories here. Um, but at the same time, that comes at the big expense of Europe. Right. And it, it only exacerbates the BSF issue that we started off talking about. Exactly. So, you know, this is the part of the market that's pretty fascinating to me right now because, you know, we, we go over, you know, this Russian gas story shutting down a chemical plant is where the rubber meets the road in terms of our physics versus platitudes battle. Right, Doom, like this is a story where now, you know, physics is about to bowl over the platitudes of green energy. And we've got a market that is so aggressively repricing, um, you know, the inflationary forces that we've been seeing all year. And obviously the inf um, inflationary forces um, kind of peaked in March, April in the markets and have backed off a bit. And then when we came out after the Fed rate hike is when they came after the natural resources sector. So now we've got this situation where we're 
you know, there's such a shortage of natural gas in Europe that they may have to set down, a sh shut down a major chemical plant. Yet the price of natural gas has come back from 10 to six and a quarter. The price of oil has backed off from 100 and a quarter to 110. And all of the equities have been thrown out with that bathwater. So that's why I look at the opportunity now in being, you know, the opportunity to buy some of these natural resources stocks on a dip and probably at some point see the tightness of these commodity markets start to show their face and start to you know put some sort of strength beside behind the physical commodity space do you have do you see that playing out in that way uh, at all doom or how are you feeling about the way the market's trading around these stories yeah you know i it, as you know i am a i subscribe to you to watch how professional traders actually trade i'm i we we pride ourselves on analysis but converting that into true trading ideas is not our specialty having said that it, it is pretty clear that companies who are back integrated to natural gas in the US and who are exposed to global prices that might result from, you know, global price spikes that might result from a super site, not just a chemical plant. We're talking like a like a super chemical, like a super site. It's it's a um, there's a German word for it that escapes me, but um, you can imagine there's a German word for everything. And um, there's a special type of chemical plant in this BSF facility is is really one of four on the planet. Um, and if it were to go offline, it would be such a big deal. But companies that sell, let's say, polyurethane, that is basically a globally traded commodity, but are back integrated into cheap energy inputs, they would be huge beneficiaries on the P&L. So companies like CF Industries that makes fertilizers, who we've talked about before in the US or Dow or you know the Huntsman's of the world, they'll be printing cash. Um, BSF is going to struggle, um, although the price increases will will help offset some of that pain because they do have many, many chemical plants around the world, of course, and they will be participating in those increased prices from those facilities, including their site in China. Um, so that, but still, it, it's a big deal. And, uh, you know, it, 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 it's one of the things about trying to understand who wins and loses is you'd really need that nuanced understanding of the flows and which products are priced regionally versus which products are priced globally. Yeah, that's a good point. And and I just want to go back to that CF trade that we, you know, we discussed. First, we were early to um, and CF ran from 60 up to 110 and peaked out in April or so. And now with this most recent pullback in natural resources has pulled back from the highs of about 115 to basically $80 where you've got the 200 day moving average support level coming in. I'm guessing that these are where the opportunities lie in the markets and things like that. And, and I'm looking for, as I kind of wrote this morning, more stocks like this, more names in the natural resources space that have backed off to areas where you can finally get them on sale. Because this, like you said, you know, a black swan event in the supply chain, it doesn't seem like something um, that commodity stocks are going to sell off on, right? Broadly speaking, over time, um, this is going to be something that should be supported for the commodity sector. And it's pretty amazing today to look up and see, you know, the grain grain markets coming apart a little bit. Um, you know, pr precious metals can't, excuse me, base metals can't rally at all. Um, so the natural resources space is still under pressure while all this tightness continues to kind of wind up below the market, if that's fair to say. And then we're going to find out in the next couple of weeks what happens when we come out of this. But it seems to me like um, in terms of the natural gas price doom, um, we may get a benefit from you know being able to, to keep that storage here. Um, the opportunity just gets more and more dire in Europe. And I'm just kind of wondering how, I, I don't know how that plays out. I don't know how that plays out when the actual supply chains break, meaning, you know, the, those um, producers aren't getting their finished goods and now can't produce their finished goods, if that's fair to say. So I think that's where we're going to run into even stickier headlines and, and even more sort of treacherous business practice as everybody tries to figure out how to maybe onshore. And I'm wondering, is that going to be the natural response from this? Or, you know, how does Germany come out of this? You know, I, I, what are your thoughts on that? So I think if we take a step back, um, I think the markets probably can't believe that there won't be a resolution in Europe and maybe pricing that in. So, I mean, let's be very clear. If there's a peace deal tomorrow, look out for a lot of these trades, right? I mean, that's the big risk. Um, the market probably can't believe that Putin is serious about cutting off European natural gas and that they believe that enough pain will quickly be felt by the Europeans or there will be some sort of breakup in the cohesion of NATO such that the countries that matter will cut 
the appropriate deals to keep the gas flowing. So I, I would argue that in this dynamic, the actuality of Putin totally turning off the gas and Europe's freezing itself, you know, allowing itself to be frozen out for the winter, literally frozen out. It's just not it's just not a likely outcome. They think that the politics will intervene. I, I, I have some doubts um, based on the statements we're seeing coming out of the political class at the G7. Um, I, 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 w I have some doubts. Now, look, I mean, it could happen. I hope it happens for the record. I'm for low oil prices. You know, the Doomberg team wants cheap natural gas. Energy is life. We don't we don't want to be right on something at the expense of people dying. Um, and we've taken our platform and used it for advocacy more than for, you know, trade input. Um, but if, you know, if you look at this price of ammonia, which we'll put up on the screen here, um, it's come off from the highs as CF Industries has, but, you know, they make a huge amount of money on this spread. And the price of ammonia is still today five times what it was during the average of 2019, 2020. Like that the, takes time for these prices to work their way through the supply chains. But with uh, U.S. natural gas in the low sixes and Dutch TTF trading at 40, that's the spread that is the bread and butter of CF Industries profitability. And they just shut down a, a, a fertilizer factor in the U.K. because they don't want to keep it running at those high prices, which which only tightens the market and 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 it causes them to make even more money. Yeah. Um, the big risk, of course, with companies like that and, and the refiners, you know, the three to one crack spread is still 55. It, it's. It's incredible that we're seeing weakness in oil with crack spreads at those levels, yeah. um, or, or in particular weakness in the equities uh, of refiners, for example, with crack spreads at those spreads. It must mean that the market thinks that there's going to be a windfall profit tax. And and look, political intervention in these markets, we've seen some very strange, uneducated, I would say, um, proclamations coming from a whole series of international leaders who just seem to be out of touch with reality. So that's for sure a risk. Like the, the, the government has power. They can... They could put their thumb on the scale and and decide that you're not going to make these profits, as as has happened in Australia in the coal market, which is maybe something we could talk about, too. Yeah, let me touch on this one real quick in terms of out of touch politicians. Let's read this quote from Senator Elizabeth Warren, which for me is a quote that like uh, really tells why she's in office. This is from April 2022. Russia's war in Ukraine has caused gas prices to rise for Americans. But giant oil corporations like Exxon are making billions in record profits. We need a windfall profits tax to tax big oil on their profits. And we need to invest in clean energy, too. So that, that to me is like the most perfectly created political quote I've ever seen. Right. She, she literally dismisses anything else other than Russia's war in Ukraine for raising gas prices in America. And then she comes back and says, we've got to invest in clean energy and tax these people that are making all this obnoxious amounts of money. So while we've got that posture here in the U.S., let's let's just stay on that topic for a while. How do you think this pans out? Is it do, does do we see that scenario where they place a windfall profits tax or cap refinery margins? And then we see um, the prices of the refineries go down, the price of gasoline go down and likely the price of oil go even higher. What are your thoughts on how this pans out here in the U.S., Doom? Yeah, you know, predict, predicting political decisions is challenging, but I, I, we, we thought it was pretty, pretty interesting that Biden skipped the meeting with the oil company CEOs. And perhaps for, we thought it was interesting for reasons that might surprise. Um, I think he realized he has a losing hand that the industry is doing all it can and that uh, attacking the industry would only make the problem worse. And I, I view him skipping that meeting and sending, um, you know, the energy secretary, Jennifer Granholm in his place, um, I view that as sort of a of a walking back of the threats, um, and I think the the pointed letters from you know CEO Chevron and from the American Petroleum Institute, which are grounded in physics, like this is just reality. This is what we could do. This is what we need. I don't think he wants to confront what he needs because he then he would have to ha explain why he's not doing it. Um, and so I, I view this as um, decreasing the possibility of windfall profits tax. You know, Elizabeth Warren says a lot of stuff that never becomes law, right. thankfully. Um, and um, and so I, I, that's kind of our view. The big thing, you know, and I, I recently appeared on um, This Week in Doom with Grant Williams, this great podcast that he and I put out. I'm biased. I think it's a good podcast. Um, and we had a long discussion about Biden's upcoming trip to Saudi Arabia, which is something that is on our radar big time. So you know, um, the consensus of view is Biden wouldn't be going to Saudi Arabia unless he had a deal struck with MBS. 
and um, that this is a headline to be feared. And maybe that's part of the reason why oil has backed off here as the trip to Saudi Arabia by Biden was confirmed. Let's call that the 85% likely chance. There's there's a 15% chance we would put it that MBS is just playing a game here and, and he's gonna embarrass Biden by sending him home with nothing. And if that happens, look out. Well, I, that that's what seems to me like a much more likely scenario than 15% probability. In fact, I would literally lift all the 15s that I could and, you know, hit all the 85% probabilities <laughs> that Biden has a deal with Mohammed bin Salman. I don't think Mohammed bin Salman has an ounce of respect for Joe Biden. And I don't even think Quite honestly, I think I'll assign a 25% chance that the meeting does not take place. And that before this happens, MBS says, like he did last time, actually, you know what? We're going to take a pass on the meeting. We're very busy here raising prices for our Asian customers. We'll be back to you, Joe. And I think that that is entirely more likely than Joe Biden striking a deal with them. But that's why we have a market. So it'll be interesting to see. I think that this is, you know, a, a tremendous opportunity pull back in energy and in oil to buy. Um, and this is kind of, it's it sort of sits along that idea that I don't think that Mohammed bin Salman is going to let Joe Biden out of this very easily or at all. Let me, let me caution a little bit though. I mean, I, I, I understand that thinking and, and I'll explain why we assign only a 15% chance. It is still the office of the president of the United States. The United States is still the unquestioned global superpower. The United States has significant military resources in the region, and it's not like we don't have a track record of using them. Uh, it, 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 there's no question that um, MBS is upset with Joe Biden and how Joe Biden labeled MBS as an outlaw um, after the killing of the Washington Post reporter Bingo. Um, and, and the maiming of that reporter in the Saudi embassy. It is still the office of the president of the United States it would be such a shocking thing to invite the president only to embarrass him and send him home with nothing that I can't, we can't bring ourselves to put a higher than 15% chance on it. I would say the market assigns it a less than 1% chance, um, 25, or, or you think it's 75, 25 the other way. That's a little rich for us, mm -hmm. but that's why it is a market. And um, I certainly love the discussion. I just want to make sure that the listeners understand Doomberg's position. <laughs> it's different than Tony's. Totally fair. Yeah. Totally fair. That's why we're going back and forth here. We're talking about the, you know, a potential energy sort of crisis and another supply chain crisis in Australia. Do you want to break that open for us? Yeah, it's a piece where we're going to publish probably before this comes out. Um, we're taking a look at what's transpired in Australia, which is really remarkable when you think about, you know, Australia, by all measures, is a global energy superpower. They are the number one exporter of coal. They're kind of tied for first with the U.S. and Qatar for exports of liquefied natural gas. They're really a fulcrum supplier in the market today as Europe goes through its energy crisis and that leaks into Asia. And despite having such a bounty of natural resources, two weeks ago, um, the majority of the Australian grid was uh, on the verge of collapse. And the government had to intervene and literally shut down the spot market for electricity, um, cap prices, um, use emergency powers to dictate um, who would supply what at what price, and had to urge the you know the consumers of Australia uh, to use as much as little energy as possible to conserve as much as possible because the grid was on the cusp of, of blackouts. And, you know, you expect that kind of thing in, you know, emerging economies where political collapse has transpired, places like Venezuela or California, but you don't expect it in a first world country like Australia. Um, and, um, and so it's a real big deal. And we, we've dug into it a little bit. We're going to publish on it. But what's really transpiring there is, despite all of the investment in renewable resources like solar and, and wind, more than two thirds of, of Australia's electricity is still generated from coal. And that industry has been under substantial attack, of course. And um, at the same time, the, much like New England, um, you know, the East Coast of Australia is paying basically international prices for natural gas, despite being one of the world's largest exporters. And um, they got caught in this sort of perfect storm of an early winter, um, you know, old coal plants that don't have an investment and then they had this, you know, um, lack of capacity versus demand, and the grid nearly collapsed. And, and that and this is Australia. This is a world superpower, and this is a real interesting example of, um, you know, the title of the piece is "Shoemaker's Children." You know, this is an example of the shoemaker's children going barefoot. I'm sure the, the good citizens of Australia must be wondering why their neighbors are being prioritized 
uh, with their, you know, the incremental vessels of liquefied natural gas when they're struggling to keep the lights on at home. And it's a real interesting phenomenon. The government's response to it is, of course, of interest to us because it signals you know, this is sort of a precursor to what we're going to see happen uh, here in the U.S. And we joked, of course, calling California a third world country, but it's not that far from it, the way they're behaving, and they're going to see the same results. And so it's really just a, a, real, a canary in the coal mine for grid stability issues uh, affecting wider parts of, of, of the U.S. and, of course, Europe with its own special situation. Man, this is a massive story. And I, I do feel like that it could be, you know, training ground for us to watch, you know, in terms of the shortages that we face. You know, we had that situation in Texas last summer, um, you know, that put a lot of strain on, on the electric grid, et cetera, et cetera. And it looks like we're going to get a good preview over there of what might happen over here. I can't imagine how, um, like you said, that they're going to allow this to happen. But this is part of that, you know, part of the ESG war that's taken place and and it's physics versus platitudes all over the world. It sounds like just to touch on California that you mentioned, I saw over the weekend that they're going to try to, you know, pass stimulus checks to send out $1,050 to all California residents to deal with the, you know, increased energy costs. You know, as we know, on the trading side, you know, more borrowing is going to mean, you know, more and more um, probably rush into hard assets, probably, you know, continue to fuel the commodity um, rally and things like that. So I don't know what I don't know how the way out of this is besides at some point, you know, politically getting to the point where we reverse a lot of the ESG policies that have been so damaging. Um, otherwise, we're going to have situations here that are going to be that rolling blackout situation that we're going to get to watch from afar. And I don't think the people are going to stand for it politically any longer. What do you think about that, Doom? Well, it's, here's an f- interesting thing, of course, and, and we include this in our upcoming piece. Um, the, the response of the Queensland, you know, the state of Queensland in Australia um, to this electricity crisis, and again, two thirds of their electricity comes from coal is um, coal prices have exploded. And, and we start the piece actually, and I'll include this you know, uh, this chart that will show the viewers here. Um, one of the really fascinating things has occurred. Uh, the, the price for thermal coal, which is the cheap, dirty coal used to make electricity, has exceeded the price of hard coking coal, which is the higher quality coal used to make steel, which I've never, I mean, we can't find data that that's ever happened before. Um, and that is what sort of set us down this path of investigating what's going on in Australia, because you have this massive spike in thermal coal and so much so that it's more valuable than cleaner, um, less sulfur, less ash, um, high quality burning coking coal. Um, it, it's unreal. It's one of those prices that that you see on your Bloomberg and you take a step back and say, OK, something significant is going on here. I don't understand it. Let's dig in. That's like a perfect Bloomberg piece for us. Yeah. And and the what the, 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 the Queensland state, the state of Queensland's response to this is to increase the royalties applied against coal producers to change the rules in the middle of the game. You know, these coal producers were all going out of business, filing for bankruptcy, losing money when coal was, you know, at its bottom. Nobody was talking about bailing out these companies. Right. These companies make all their money in very short period, very short periods of time. If you want to encourage investment in the maintenance of these facilities so that you can affect a reasonable transition, um, you need to be, allow them to earn their cost of capital and then some. Um, and what instead they're doing is exactly what you would expect, you know, the people without physics training to do, which is they're attacking supply. They're taking that windfall profits, putting it into the general budget, wasting it on God knows what government programs. And the key message uh, is don't invest here. And so uh, there won't be investment. And so when there isn't investment and capacity decreases and they have to turn the lights off, they can look to decisions like that. Uh, for for a reasonable explanation, right there. That that is it. That is where the platitudes get smashed by physics every time. It looks like we're going to see a lot of episodes um, along these lines, um, where the politicians get tested by the markets, and we'll see how they react. Um, if the if the reaction continues to be in every direction, but at the core source of the problem, I'm going to continue to remain bullish in the energy space. Doom. So we, before signing off, why don't we tell people where they can find you and read this upcoming piece on um, the Australia sort of energy coal situation. I'm dying to read it myself. Give new readers a chance to um, look you up, Doom. Where can we find you? Yeah, so um, first place they can find us is on Twitter at Doomberg T. Um, next is they can find us at, um, at doomberg.substack.com. 
Um, for free subscribers, they get a nice preview of the pieces. Um, for paid subscribers, and we have a couple of tiers, they get the full pieces delivered to their inbox the moment we publish them. Um, and those are the two main places we operate. Um, and and really appreciate the opportunity to uh, give us give give our little plug and to be back here with you, Tony and team is great. Absolutely, it really is. I happen to be a pro tier subscriber of Doomberg's work, and I enjoy all of the content that he puts out. And it's absolutely necessary to my um, background in trading the natural resources space today. So I can't thank you enough for that and continuing um, your team putting out the content that you put up. You can find me at tgmacro.com. I'm Tony Greer. Doom, thanks for going over all this today. And we'll check back in in a couple of weeks to see what develops. Good deal. Thanks, Tony. Thanks very much. We hope you enjoyed the video. At Real Vision, we help you understand the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy with in-depth analysis from real experts. Join the revolution at realvision.com.